how how <laughs> I, I can't I can't help but kind of giggle a little bit like how predictable of a Seymour to want to <laughs> marry somebody who's <laughs> close to the throne. I hate to say that, but it just seems like such a typical Seymour thing, doesn't it? The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. The life of Catherine Gray is often overshadowed by that of her sister, Lady Jane Gray. And so today I invited Connor Byrne to the show to discuss his research into Catherine's life. Connor, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm really excited to talk about Catherine. Like I said, she's so overshadowed by her sister. And I kind of want to just start out. This is something I do with a, a lot of new guests is I start out wanting to know what got you interested in wanting to do more research on Catherine's life. Um, that's a really good question. I think, you know, like a lot of people, I've always been very interested in Lady Jane Grey. You know, she's very well known as the Nine Day Queen, as this very tragic figure. Um, but I think, you know, reading more about Jane's family and finding out that she had two younger sisters who were also in the line of succession, both of whom were proposed as candidates to succeed Elizabeth, and um, especially the middle sister, Catherine, you know, was very interesting in and of itself. And I think realising as well that Catherine also had, in some respects, as equally tragic a life as Jane, it was just something that I found very interesting in the fact that um, she possessed a very strong claim to the throne, according to Henry VIII's last will and testaments. And um, ultimately, if Elizabeth had followed her father's wishes, then the future of the English monarchy could have been very different. And you know, we might not have the monarchy that we have today. So um, I think it was just kind of this importance that Catherine had that seems to me that it was kind of neglected or, um, as you say, she was, you know, she is still very much overshadowed by her older sister. And I think that more people deserve to know this importance and um, kind of how strong her claim actually was to succeed Elizabeth, um, I think needs, you know, deserves to be recognised. So the, the reason I invited Connor to the show today is because he just wrote a book about the life of Lady Catherine Gray, the dynastic tragedy. Connor, do you know, does it have a different title in the U.S.? Uh, no, it has the exact same title. And I think it's coming out in April. So a few months time. Awesome. So I've just started reading this book. I highly recommend you pre-order it now because Connor is going to give us all type of inf all types of information today on Catherine Gray. And I think you're going to be intrigued enough to want to know more. So Connor, you know, you told us why you're interested in researching her, why you wrote this book. Maybe for, again, for those who aren't familiar with her, give us a little bit of her backstory, maybe who her parents were when she was born, that kind of stuff. So Catherine Gray is the, or sorry, she was the second daughter of Henry Gray, who was the Marquess of Dorset and later Duke of Suffolk and um, Francis Brandon. And it's via her mother that uh, Catherine has royal blood because her mother, Francis, was the granddaughter of Henry VII, the first Tudor king, um, via his youngest surviving daughter, Mary, who uh, was Queen Consort of France and later became Duchess of Suffolk when she married um, Charles Brandon. Um, Catherine's date of birth is not known for certain, um, but she's thought to have been born in 1540. So this would make her around three years or so younger than Jane Grey, her older sister. And um, she has a younger sister, Mary, thought to have been born in 1545. Um, uh, Jane is thought to have been born in London, potentially, but both of the younger Grey sisters are thought to have been born at Bradgate, which was the Grey family residence in um, Leicestershire. Um, and, you know, we know not, not very much about Catherine's childhood. Her sister Jane is, you know, far better documented. She was, as you know, many know, extremely well-educated, um, all three girls were brought up, you know, in the Protestant faith. Um, but it's only really Jane that is, you know, kind of remarked on as being this very pious, 
Protestant made and who corresponded with European reformers. Um, one of the misconceptions I try to address in the book is this belief that Catherine was only, you know, merely the beauty of the Grey family, that she was perhaps not very intelligent. Um, I don't think there's much evidence either way to say, you know, to say how intelligent she actually was. I think a lot of it comes from the benefit of hindsight with her love affair with Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, and maybe kind of retrospect, retroactively, sorry, and um, applying what we know of that to her intelligence or, you know, lack thereof, as some have suggested. And then, sorry, just thinking in terms of what else is interesting with Catherine. And so I think what the book really tries to talk about as well is until Jane was proclaimed Queen of England in July 1553, we know, you know, relatively little about Catherine. She, you know, was a very obscure figure until then when she was roughly, you know, the age of 13. But as the book really tries to, you know, get across, she and her sisters were recognised, their royal status was recognised by Henry VIII in his last will and testament of 1546, which decreed that if all three of his children, Edward, Mary and Elizabeth, died without heirs of their bodies, then the crown would pass in turn to the heirs of his younger sister Mary, which was the Grey line. So Jane and her heirs, then Catherine and her heirs, and finally Mary, Grey and her heirs. And it's really in the final months of Edward VI's reign that this dynastic importance comes to the fore, because, as is well known, Edward uh, was determined to prevent either of his half-sisters from succeeding him um, because he viewed them as illegitimate. And plus, Mary Tudor, uh, her Catholic faith, was also abhorrent to the very, you know, radically Protestant Edward. So the dying king instead uh, bequeathed the crown to um, the heirs of Jane Grey. But when it became clear that Jane would not produce a son before the king's death, Edward changed his will and Jane was named heir herself, um, with Catherine to follow her and any sons that Jane had. Um, Two months prior to this, Jane and Catherine had both married in a triple wedding. The, The third person to get married was the Duke of Northumberland's daughter. And these marriages have kind of been seen traditionally as part of this plot on the part of the Duke of Northumberland and Jane Grey's parents um, to essentially change the succession and have Jane become Queen of England instead of Mary uh, Tudor, because Jane was marrying Guilford Dudley, who was a younger son of the Duke of Northumberland. Um, But recent historians, and I agree with this as well, have suggested that it was much more, the succession crisis was much more, you know, Edward VI's own wishes and the marriages were, you know, just a very traditional, un, you know, uh, an extraordinary even um, married, marriage alliances made between members of the nobility. And um, you mentioned as well Jane's parents and Catherine's parents, I should say. Um, yes, traditionally have not had a very positive reputation. And um, for anyone who has maybe seen the 1986 film Lady Jane mm-hmm. um, with Helena Bonham Carter um, playing Jane, will be very aware of um, the fact that the great parents are not portrayed very well. They are, you know, ambitious, power hungry and physically violent. There's a very memorable scene when Jane refuses to marry Guilford Dudley, which is historically accurate, her refusal. Um, and she's beaten by her mother until she capitulates. Um, and we've, we see a number of modern novels as well, which have followed this, um, especially in terms of Jane and, Gre- Jane and Catherine's mother, Frances, being very physically abusive, you know, of the two parents. Um, And the suggestion that all three great daughters had this very unhappy childhood where they were manipulated by their parents and, you know, physically punished if they, you know, did not live up to their expectations. Recent historians, and I follow this in the book, have tried to provide a more nuanced interpretation of the Grey sisters' childhoods. And... you know, the suggestion that Jane Grey in particular was abused by her parents comes from a, re- a recollection made by Elizabeth I's tutor, Roger Ascombe, um, some years after Jane's death, in which he basically suggests that he had this conversation with Jane in which she said that she had to do everything perfectly or her parents would, you know, chastise her and, um, you know, physically and mentally if she did not, you know, live up to their expectations. Um, but aside from this, we have no evidence of, you know, what the Grey sisters' relations were like with their parents. And, um, you know, there's nothing to suggest that they were particularly, you know, abusive more than, you know, the standards of the society. 
Um, and what my book tries to explore as well is when Catherine was engaged in this love affair with Edward Seymour, um, it was very important for her to seek the approval of her mother, um, whose intercession she tried to obtain with Elizabeth I in order for them to marry. So I don't think that this necessarily suggests that Catherine had a bad relationship with her mother. And um, I think a lot of it probably comes from reading too much into Ascombe's report of what Jane said. Um, and, you know, even if Jane potentially had more difficult relations with her mother in particular, it doesn't necessarily mean that her younger sisters did. Um, right. So I think, uh, yes, I think with that, with that, there's probably a lot of smoke, but not much fire, if that makes sense. I've Sorry. always wondered, you know, when we are researching history, we always have mm. to step back from it and yeah. figure out what the motives are for people to say mm. these things. Do we have any idea what the motive would have been for Asham to say these things about the Greys? Yes, definitely. Um, yes, um, I do go into this a little bit in the book. Um, a few historians have suggested, and um, I, you know, do find this quite convincing myself, that I think with Ascombe, you know, he had this kind of educational purpose for writing where by using his reported conversation with Jane, what he was really trying to bring home was the fact that um, children learn better when they have, you know, a kind teacher and, mm. you know, there's this kind of positive relationship going on. Um, and, you know, so I think with Jane's words, you know, if they, of course, even happened as they were reported, I think they can be taken out of context and then, you know, used to apply to this kind of relationship as a whole when, you know, I think it's it's reading a lot into it, I think, that isn't necessarily there. So. Right. Yeah. And I do want to go back to the triple wedding, too, because I'm just fascinated by the idea that they had this triple wedding. Mm. I read something once and I want you to either correct me or elaborate on it a little bit more was did, did people get sick after like after the meal that they had together? Yes, definitely. That is that that is one suggestion. And um, we know that Jane's husband, Guilford Dudley, was one of the individuals who was stricken down with food poisoning from something that had been eaten at the wedding. Um, if I remember correctly, I think it was salad or something like mm. that. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't think we know if either of the Grave sisters fell ill, but Guilford Dudley definitely did, unfortunately wow. for him. So <laughs> <laughs> it always makes you wonder poison, right? Because back then mm. it always seems like that was a bit, that would be a quick way to solve a problem is by yes. poisoning the future heirs or, you know. <laughs> mm. Definitely. <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, you briefly mentioned Edward Seymour and I've always, you know, I am. Mm. OK, so I'm just a romantic at heart. And really, my <laughs> my favorite part of her story is this love mm. affair with Edward Seymour, mm. Earl of Hartford. But is there reason to believe that it wasn't as romantic as I actually imagined it? That's that's a very good question. I think, as you say, traditionally, this marriage, you know, is very much looked at as a love affair. And I think it's fair to say that, I think, yes, I would agree that it was. Um, but yes, as you kind of suggest, um, you know, it has been suggested by some that perhaps with Hartford in particular, that perhaps he had other motivations <laughs> for his attraction to Catherine. And, you know, at the time when they fall in love, um, which is, you know, the closing days of Mary I's reign and the beginning of Elizabeth I's reign, um, Catherine is in a very strong dynastic position. Um, and, you know, it's entirely possible, I think, that it could have crossed Hartford's mind that he could well be marrying the heir to the throne if Elizabeth, you know, should not have a child of her own. Um, I think in terms of the sources that I consulted, I think it's, you know, I don't think there's enough evidence to support that. I think the nature of their relationship, the details that we have and, you know, the risks that they went to, I think to me suggests that it was a love affair um, and, you know, they probably didn't think too much about the consequences because as the book suggests, um, it was technically against the law for them to marry and um, you know members of the royal family had to secure permission from the monarch um, and failure to do so was an act of treason and um, as as was seen during the reign of Henry VIII with Lady Margaret Douglas who was um, one of his nieces when she fell in love with Lord Thomas Howard both were imprisoned in the Tower of London and 
this took place only months after Anne Boleyn's execution. So I think, you know, they, they both could well have thought that they might be following her to the, to the scaffold. So, um, so these kinds of risks that Catherine and Hartford were taking, um, to me, suggest that it probably was a love affair and, um, you know, but I think both were well aware of these risks because, as I suggested just now with Frances, um, Catherine was very determined to secure her mother's, um, you know, first of all, her consent and also her mother's assistance with the Queen um, and the, her stepfather's assistance as well. So, um, and we know that Hartford, Hartford also spoke to his mother and the Duchess of Somerset. So um, I think they were trying to seek assistance to ensure that Elizabeth would agree to the marriage. Um, but, you know, for reasons that the book goes into, unfortunately, this did not go according to plan and mm. both obviously paid the price. Yeah. So. How, how <laughs> I, just, I, I can't I can't help but kind of giggle a little bit, like how predictable of a Seymour to want to <laughs> marry somebody who's <laughs> close to the throne. I hate to say that, but it just seems like such a typical Seymour thing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have mm. any idea how Catherine and Edward met? Was it just court circles or family connections? How did they meet? Um, well, Catherine was very close to one of Hartford's sisters who was named Jane, probably after the um, late Queen Jane Seymour, who was Hartford's um, aunt. Um, and both served, you know, in the both served the Queen, first Mary I and later Elizabeth I. Um, and in 1558, which was the final year of Mary I's reign, um, there was an influenza epidemic of courts, which Mary is thought to have you know, succumbed to as her cause of death. So um, both girls were absent from court in the autumn of that year because Jane had fallen ill. Um, so they both retired to the Duchess of Somerset, who was Jane's mother's residence at Hamworth, where Hartford was then residing. And it's thought that Hartford and Catherine fell in love then. Interestingly, um, during Edward VI reign, when Hartford's father was the um, Lord Protector, um, Hartford had been proposed as a possible husband for Jane Grey. So there was this kind of interesting existing link already. Um, in terms of the actual details of you know, their initial relations with each other, there isn't a great deal to go on, but it's clear from what both would subsequently say that they both did fall in love and this kind of, you know, clandestine relationship began in the last days of Mary's reign and, you know, into Elizabeth's reign. Um, and we know that the Duchess actually kind of tried to warn Hartford off, probably because she was aware of Catherine's royal mm -hmm. blood and, um, you know, was aware that, you know, Catherine could be seen as a possible dynastic threat to Elizabeth. Um, but really the affair gathered momentum once Elizabeth took the throne and the couple, you know, began meeting in secret with Jane's assistance. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably without Jane's assistance, it would have been a lot more difficult for them to meet. And that's also kind of how the wedding took place as well. Jane was very actively involved in, you know, seeking out the priest and in assisting with the marriage at Hartford's residence at Cannon Row. Um, and she went back with Catherine to court as well once the couple had married um, and then assisted them with their meetings in the various palaces. Um, so I would say probably it was initially through Jane that Catherine developed this, you know, relationship with Hartford and um, this kind of initial closeness with his sister, I think was probably central to that, I think. I just can't. <laughs> I love these stories. <laughs> I just think they're so great. Um so so they marry in secret, but there's mm. even even though everybody knows this goes against the crown, mm. there should have been some type of documentation of the marriage. Mm. But if I gather correctly from your research, there was something missing. Mm. Yes, yes. Essentially, it went wrong in every possible way that it could have done, because um, as I mentioned earlier, Catherine and Hartford both tried to seek parental assistance. Um, Catherine approached, well, actually, sorry, no, Hartford initially approached Catherine's mother and stepfather even before she had spoken to them, you know, explaining that he wanted to marry Catherine, and she then spoke to them as well. And between them, they agreed that Cat Catherine's mother, Frances, would approach the Queen and seek her intercession. Um, but tragically for them, Frances died in November 1559, um, you know, we're not 100% sure of the cause, but it essentially meant that she was never able to speak to Elizabeth and she wasn't able to deliver to her a letter that she had written, essentially, you know, give, you know, 
explaining that her daughter wanted to marry Hartford. Um, Irrespective of this, the couple pressed ahead with their plans. Um, they married at Cannon Row, which was Hartford's residence in London, with Jane Seymour's assistance. Um, the priest we know very little about, um, but and it was you know for precisely that reason as well. Catherine was unsure of his of his identity, so she was unable later to identify him. Um, and Jane, who was serving as the only witness because the couple had arranged in advance for all of Hartford's servants to be absent from the house, um, you know, to keep it as secret as possible. Um, Jane was the only witness to the marriage, um, but she died in March 1561 when she was only 19. So it meant that when the marriage eventually came to public attention, she was unable to testify to it. And without any witnesses and without being able to find the priest, um, and as you say, without any documentation, they could not prove that the marriage had taken place. And this ultimately proved catastrophic for them because, you know, there was nothing to say that they were really husband and wife. Um, so it, it was all of these circumstances that essentially backfired completely against them. Right. And then she ends up pregnant and in the Tower of London. Mm. Yes, that's right. Yes. Well, okay. that, that, yes, that's how the marriage became public because... Um, you know, she tried to conceal her pregnancy for as long as possible um, during the summer progress in 1561. Um, Hartford was then on a grand tour of Europe. He had been sent abroad. Um, William Cecil, who was Elizabeth's um, chief statesman, had essentially tried to warn him off. Um, so Hartford was then abroad. Catherine had heard nothing from him. She was understandably panicking um, and eventually confided in um, Bess Sentler, who was, you know, later known as Bess of Hardwick, um, when she was eight months pregnant. And she also confided in Robert Dudley, who was Elizabeth I's favourite. Mm -hmm. um, and both Bess and Robert also panicked. And uh, Dudley, Robert Dudley went to the Queen and she reacted with fury and, you know, did not hesitate to send Catherine to the Tower. And Hartford was swiftly recalled um, back to London from Europe and placed in the tower as well. <laughs> so she gives birth to their first child in the tower, right? Yes. And yeah. and then help me with the timeline here because I'm a little gray. She, <laughs> I didn't mean that pun there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she ends up pregnant again. Was she? She was still in the tower, right? And they were having some secret mm. trysts. <laughs> How did that even happen? How did that work out? Mm, yes, so she gives birth to the first son, Edward Seymour, in September 1561, um, having, you know, been imprisoned when she was already eight months or so pregnant. Elizabeth had instructed the guards to keep both couple, sorry, both parties, you know, separate from each other. They were not allowed to meet under any circumstances, but it seems that their guards took pity on them and essentially allowed them to meet. We know that Hartford visited Catherine's lodgings at least three times in the, you know, the following spring. And she gave birth to their second son, Thomas Seymour, in uh, February 1563. And understandably, Elizabeth was even more furious when she found out because, you know, her instructions had been disobeyed. So, yeah. Clearly <laughs> disobeyed when she ends up pregnant again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so how long was she in the Tower of London? So um, they were incarcerated there um, August 1561, and they were released two years later in September 1563. And this, I don't think, should be seen as a you know charitable move on Elizabeth's behalf. There was then plague in London, so I think it was for this reason that um, it was decided to remove both of them from the tower. Um, they were then placed under house arrest, but not together. They were placed under separate house arrest. So I think what is really tragic about the whole story is essentially, you know, after this point, Catherine never saw Hartford again. And um, she was placed in house arrest with her second son, Thomas, whereas Hartford was placed with the elder son, Edward. So she never saw her elder son again either. So um, very tragic for both, yeah. you know, for both those things. It's very, very tragic. And, and you mentioned 15, I think you said 1563, she was released from the tower, which I find interesting because that's not long after Elizabeth I almost died from smallpox, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she had fallen ill with smallpox in uh, October 1562. 
Um, and uh, only four months, uh, sorry, only four years into um, taking the throne. Yeah. But even at this very early point in her reign, there was already a great deal of anxiety about the succession. And the fact that Elizabeth was feared to have almost died um, sent a lot of her councillors into panic. Um, and there was this, you know, very secret privy council meeting where they were, you know, debating who should be named heir if Elizabeth did die. And Catherine was only one of several candidates who was proposed. So, um, yeah, a, a very tense time in Elizabeth's reign, for sure. Yeah, I'm sure she felt torn on the whole thing, too. Like, my my cousin just totally disobeyed me, but I still need her just in case. Exactly, yes. Um, and I think for Catherine's supporters, the fact that she had given birth to two sons only strengthened her claim um, alongside her Protestant faith and, you know, being married to a Protestant as well. It was these all of these circumstances that really made her claim so strong for those who supported her. Obviously, there were, you know, plenty who didn't, but for her supporters, you know, her claim was only strengthened by giving birth to two sons. Right, exactly. And, and um, is it true that Catherine died from starving herself? Um, it potentially there's two schools of thought I would say where um the traditional explanation is that she died of um, consumption which we now know as tuberculosis um but some historians think that you know she perhaps starved herself having to come to to spare um we do know from her letters she and her uncle Lord John Gray with whom she resided when she was under house arrest for long periods um both parties wrote a number of letters to you know, William Cecil to the Queen herself and to Robert Dudley, you know, seeking their intercession to get to try and get Catherine restored to favour. And these letters really provide a snapshot into Catherine's deteriorating mental state. And, you know, we know that she wasn't eating from, you know, quite early on in her house arrest and that she, you know, would not be leaving her bed. And I think it was just the sense of despair that, you know, she was passed from her husband and her elder son. And, you know, perhaps she felt that she would never you know, be restored to royal favour. Um, so it's possible that she did, uh, you know, I suppose you can't really use modern labels like depression, but it's possible that we would recognise something like that. But equally possible, perhaps she did die of um, consumption, which, you know, was a leading cause of death at the time. So um, so it's a bit ambiguous, I would say, with that. It's so heartbreaking, Connor, just to... To think, it seems like she really loved Edward Seymour and they had these children together and then they were separated and she was separated for one of, from one of her sons. As a mm. mom, that just tugs at my heartstrings. Like, I can't even imagine mm. how difficult that would have, even in the Tudor times, how difficult that would have been to be separated. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, that's something that, that my book really tries to get across, you know, Compared with Mary, Queen of Scots, who was her, you know, leading rival, I suppose you would say, for the succession, who, you know, was involved during a number of conspiracies against Elizabeth, there's no suggestion that Catherine was actively pressing for her succession rights to be recognised and that she was determined to be named as the heir presumptive. Her letters and those of her uncle, you know, suggest very strongly that she was longing to be reunited with her husband and her elder son and... I think the fact that obviously as the years passed, I think she gradually would have lost more and more hope um, and realised that Elizabeth was not going to forgive her. And um, I think from that perspective, it's probably not surprising that she only died a few years into the ha her house arrest because, because of this deterioration in her mental state. Yeah. I, I do want to know whenever there's like a biography of this type done on somebody, I want to know from your research, Connor, what was the most interesting or surprising thing that you learned doing this uh, book? That is a good question. I think, um, so I, you know, knowing that Catherine, you know, obviously was a very important figure in the succession crisis of Elizabeth's reign. But I think what was really fascinating was, you know, if you consult the ambassador's reports from only a few months into Elizabeth's reign, you know, it's very clear that she was being proposed as this viable claimant by the imperial ambassador and that there was this scheme to have her married to Philip of Spain's um, son, Don Carlos, because of, because of their belief 
mistakenly as it turned out, that Catherine was a Catholic. So it was this, you know, very strong hope that, you know, she would restore Catholicism to England if she was married to the Spanish king's son. Um, and not just interest from Spain as well, but also in Scotland, there was this rumour that she would be married to um, the Earl of Iran, who was recognised by some as the uh, presumptive to the Scottish throne, so it would unite the English and Scottish crowns. Um, and I think, as I mentioned at the very start of this talk, it's kind of this dynastic importance she had that I think I think can be overlooked because we know how the story ends. We know that Elizabeth did not follow her father's wishes um, by choosing Catherine as her successors. She obviously chose the Scottish line, um, but no one knew this at the time. And I think while Catherine is best known for her love affair, she has this kind of dynastic importance that I think deserves to be better known because if Elizabeth had recognised it, then the future of the British monarchy could have been very different. So, you know, far-reaching consequences. There could have been a Seymour dynasty. Mm, but yes, very <laughs> possible. <laughs> of course, that's intriguing to me. <laughs> <laughs> so there are so many myths surrounding Catherine's life. What would you say, maybe one that we didn't cover today, um, would be one of the biggest ones? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think probably one of the biggest myths about Catherine is that she was stupid or, you know, essentially lacked intelligence. And um, I think it, it's very difficult to say either way, but we do know that all three Grey sisters, you know, had, very, had a very good education. We know that the younger sister, Mary, um, was similar to Jane in that she, you know, had very strong linguistic ability. She knew French and Italian, and she also shared Jane's, you know, Protestant sympathies, you know, judging by her reading material. Um, Catherine, there's less information. I think it is probably fair to say that she was not as pious as either of her sisters. Um, but I think it's difficult to say that she was unintelligent based on very limited information. I think, as I mentioned a bit earlier, I think a lot of it is based on her actions with Hartford and kind of this naivety and foolishness. But I think it's difficult to say purely on that basis that, you know, she was stupid. I, th I think that's a little unfair. But um, that she maybe lacked Jane Grey's precocious intelligence, I think it's probably fair to say, but, you know, Jane was exceptional, um, Definitely. So. <laughs> Love that. Well, Connor, before we go today, I do want to let everybody know that you are working on your PhD right now. Congratulations. And why don't you let everybody know what it is you're studying? Oh, thank you. Um, well, uh, there is there is a link with Catherine because one of the figures is her sister, Jane Grey. But the project is the four executed British queens, um, so the two wives, Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard, um, Jane Grey and Mary, Queen of Scots, and the project is looking at 16th and 17th century representations of these executions in historical and literary sources, so it's a broad range of materials, you know, it's obviously the traditional chronicles, ambassadors, dispatches, things like that, but also things like poetry, plays, and how they how they were represented in the decades after their deaths and their posthumous reputations. So it's a very interesting project. It seems like such a big subject to try and cover. Like it is, yeah. <laughs> I don't even and how many different languages are you having to read documents in right now? Um I would say in total including English, it's been up to about seven languages. So it's been quite a lot, but um, obviously there's discrepancies in, you know, the numbers of sources because I would say French is probably the biggest and Latin as well, whereas for something like Dutch, fortunately, not too much. So because that's that's a whole other ball game. So. Well, this is absolutely amazing and good luck on your PhD. And Connor, thank you so much for coming on the show today to tell us more about Lady Catherine Gray because I've been wanting to really shed a bigger spotlight on her life, and I'm glad you were able to join me today to do so. So thank you for coming on. Oh, well, no problem. Thanks so much for hosting me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.